Hi, Jeffrey. Good morning, Bob. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Oh, not so bad. Good. Uh, we've got uh, uh, some developments uh, on the weapons front. This yes. this uh, China anti-satellite uh, test and the uh, and some stuff in Iran that also uh, bears on the impending apocalypse. And when you know <laughs> when, when as the apocalypse approaches, I always like to check in with people like you who know something about weapons. <laughs> um, now, first right, of all, I, you're, I think you're, you're actually uh, leaving uh, Cambridge, going to uh, New America Foundation in Washington, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, March one, I'll be the director of their uh, nuclear strategy and nonproliferation initiative. That's great. Steve Clemens is assembling quite the powerhouse there. He uh, he brought Flint Leverett over not so long ago, and the, the, there's other people. I was thinking. Uh, you know, after the, the, the uh, next election, when the Democrats uh, take power in the White House, it might be easier just to move the State Department to the New America Foundation rather than I would be you very guys happy with that outcome. You think so? Yeah, exactly. Plus, you know, Foggy Bottom has its name for a reason. I, I like DuPont Circle yeah. a little bit. No, I think, I think that should be a, the first Democratic initiative. Um, okay, <laughs> well, listen, uh, on this, this China thing, I gather that... China has finally started talking about it and conceded that this uh, they did test an anti-satellite weapon, um, right. and they say, but they say, but they're not in favor of an arms race in space, as they put it, which of course is not actually where the arms race we're talking about would take place anyway, because these are ground-based weapons, right? Right. Well, I mean, what you have there is a sort of legacy of the. Well, more or less the 1970s. Uh, like, there is this entire kind of historical debate about uses of outer space, and that's always the, the phrase that gets used, is arms race in outer space. Uh, but that, you know, like most international negotiating terms, that's way outlived its usefulness, but it still gets used. Okay. They, um, now, China, uh, in, 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 the, in the first round of coverage, on the, uh, newspaper coverage, uh, I, uh, in both the Times and the Washington Post, I think it was noted, and I'll ask if this is accurate, that China had been interested in a ban on this kind of testing for some time. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, uh, starting in about uh, January 99. Okay, and there had been no action on that front, not just during the Bush administration, but, but you know, we had eight years of Clinton administration during which I guess America did not take much of an initiative in terms of securing a ban on this kind of testing, right? Uh, it was the opposite of an, an initiative. I mean, what was happening was the Chinese were saying they were worried about missile defense, and so they wanted to talk about an arms race in space. Uh, and the Clinton administration, which was basically terrified of the Republican Congress, uh, was like, absolutely not. And so the Clinton administration and the Bush administration actually shut down international negotiations at the CD, uh, more or less consistently uh, since 1999. And, the, and also, I gather, there was a certain amount of momentum emanating kind of from the, the Pentagon. I mean, there, there, was, there, there is yeah. this U.S. Space Command thing, right. well, which its is doctrine, going back to the Clinton administration, has been that it wants to secure, I gather, the eternal control of space by the United States. Yeah, there are a whole bunch of phrases like that, like the ultimate high ground and all kinds of goofy stuff. Um, the, there is definitely a component within the Air Force that wants to do this. And the, the U.S. Space Command essentially got merged uh, with another command, Strategic Command, which handles all of the nuclear weapons. Uh, and so they got kind of dampened down a little bit. Um, so, you know, eh. But there are, you know, there are always Star Warriors running around. Okay, now, now l l let's run through the, the kind of the logic behind, uh, a, a, you know, a ban on, on right. anti-satellite weapons. I mean, the logic deployed by people who, who favor that. And let me tell you why I actually think this is, we're really at, at kind of quite a crossroads here, the whole planet is, uh, in, in, in terms of figuring out whether we're going to clamp down on this kind of stuff or not. And, and I, I honestly don't know exactly what you'll say, whether I'm over-dramatizing it or not, because we've never talked about this. But first of all, there, there is an argument that transparency, even symmetrical transparency, I mean, especially symmetrical transparency in some cases, tends to be stabilizing, right? I mean, if you imagine, say, uh, India and Pakistan, they both have nukes. If you imagine the, the kinds of things that are likely to trigger an actual nuclear attack, they tend to be things like, uh, you know, one side imagining that something's happening over yeah. on the other side, you know, in terms of, you know, a marshalling of forces and, a, you know, a massing of troops or you something. You know, this is really weird. Stuff. 
that it might know was actually not happening if it had if it if things were transparent and it had good satellite imagery, right? Right. Well, I mean, this is really weird because I made exactly this point in a paper a couple of years ago that in the middle of uh, like the I guess it was the uh, Cargill crisis, uh, maybe that was like '99. Uh, I'm gonna screw up the dates, obviously. I mean, at one point, we more or less just showed the Pakistani satellite photographs of the Indians in order to get them to calm down. Um, and that kind of thing is totally valuable. Uh, and, you know, satellites are good for that. And so in a situation where one side thinks that it's all of a sudden going to go blind, you know, not only is there the risk that they're not going to be able to see what's going on and that they're going to overreact, but that they might overreact preemptively. Um, and actually, I mean, the people I worry about doing that is the United States. I mean, to walk through the logic of an anti-satellite ban, when, when we start to look at how we're going to protect our satellites, you know, we're hugely dependent on space assets, there, there are actually essentially no effective defensive measures. Um, you know, things are in space are moving so quickly uh, that you can't really shield. It's not super practical to put, you know, interceptors up. Um, there aren't really any good defensive options. And you know, we're not going to deter the Chinese by threatening to knock out the, you know, six satellites or whatever they have at any given time. Uh, and so I think the thing that the U.S. military is going to conclude is that the best defense is a good offense, and that early on in a crisis with the Chinese, if they see any indication that the China starts shooting down satellites, uh, you're going to get a massive escalation, and that's something I'm really worried about. There's also the possibility of, in an environment where you know they have a whole array of, of these weapons, there's, there's, the, there's the danger of misinterpreting some oh, kind absolutely. of outage in a satellite as an attack, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, once you, once you have two nuclear forces that are kind of tightly bound together by, uh, you know, timelines and vulnerabilities, the chance that something minuscule is going to set off a kind of spiral, I, I think, is, well, I mean, it's more than zero, and with nuclear weapons, more than zero is too much of a risk. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me the, the basic situation is when the Pentagon imagines itself fighting a war, it plausibly, logically, rightly says, we want to have the advantage in information. I mean, its job is to imagine fighting wars. Right. On the other hand, if you back up and ask, wait a second, how are we likely to keep ourselves from getting into a war with a nuclear-armed superpower, which would be nice, <laughs> then, 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 then you start seeing the advantages uh, of actually constraining our ability to cripple their information uh, capabilities if that would mean constraining their ability to cripple ours. In other words, symmetrical transparency and, I, and this is not just kind of a far left argument. I, th I think a lot of a lot of uh, a fairly broad spectrum of people who think about arms control would say, in the long run, symmetrical transparency is a good thing for the United States compared to the alternative we're talking about, right? Right. I I, I would think that that's true. Uh, the thing that I was going to say is I've got a friend who works for the Air Force uh, in uh, a reasonably important space position, and I think under no circumstances could one refer to this person as being on the left. And his argument uh, is essentially very similar. I mean, he thinks that, typically speaking, you know, we use space largely for routine and peaceful purposes, that the U.S. military basically uses space for routine operations, and that when we are going to go in and fight in some place, that that is usually a geographically limited and a, a sort of short in duration event. And so it's always struck him as being kind of crazy to organize this massive peacetime routine architecture, uh, to organize that entirely around what are essentially rare and unusual events. And so, you know, he tends to be much more of the idea that, you know, space ought to be about handling things like navigation and communications and, you know, if you're going to actually be fighting someone, then you've got typically enough lead time that you, know, you do that with assets in theater. Yeah. Yeah, I actually wrote a piece for the New York Times about six years ago, New York Times Magazine, about, uh, w w you know, as commercial uh, imagery was starting to come online and more companies were launching these commercial satellites. And I talked to a lot of people in the arms control community, and it seemed like, you know, kind of the common sense view was, was on balance, this is a good thing. I mean, even the, yeah. even the, the you know, these commercial satellites getting in the business, even if it moves beyond the control of governance, governments, that, that is probably a good thing because more transparency is good. And so now we face a situation where if we get in, you know, if China keeps developing these weapons, and especially if we respond and, and you know, a, a huge uh, a race heats up in this realm, it could be very bad 
for the whole world. At, at any rate, that argument certainly, I think, deserves scrutiny at this time, and people should decide whether or not they buy into it. And if they do, the next question becomes kind of is it too late, uh, you know, to get the, 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 the horse back in the barn or whatever the metaphor is, right? Right. Well, I mean, the global part is the thing that I think is so important. You know, the physics of space matter, and the way orbit works is you don't stay in one place at the same time. It's that you're constantly moving. And so space is, just by the, the physical nature of how orbits work, is a global place. You don't really have the option of seizing a portion of it. You know, the Chinese satellite that has been blown up now, that the Chinese blew up, uh, has created a big debris cloud. And that debris is going to stay in orbit, and it's going to pose uh, a relatively small but still real hazard to other satellites for a decade. And so if you get into the kind of situation where people are testing a lot of anti-satellite weapons, where there isn't a lot of international cooperation, uh, you know, if you can't have simple discussions like let's not make debris, then you actually really do have a kind of classic tragedy of the commons situation where in the sort of selfish pursuit of their own narrow self-interests, uh, several countries could actually, you know, ruin uh, the environment for uh, pretty much everybody. Okay. So, you know, it would How's be nice to stop this, this thing before it gets to be too far. I mean, it would be nice to stop this before China actually has tremendous confidence uh, that they can yeah. destroy well, satellites you know what uh, on pisses demand. Me off. I was heartened by some things I read on your, your blog, um, Arms Control Wonk, uh, that, to the effect, a couple of things. First of all, they... They, they, did, they seem to have done three unsuccessful tests before they finally got one to succeed, which is all the more reason we should have gotten into this business uh, of, of working on a, a treaty, uh, you know, a while ago. And, and, again, you know, the responsibility, as you said, goes back to the Clinton administration. I mean, we laugh at the neocons for thinking that America can be eternally preeminent but in a sense, that logic was implicit, kind of, in, in, in the Clinton administration failing to do, it, do anything, and was almost explicit in the in this Space Command doctrine. But the the the, uh, the other good news I saw on your blog uh, was that even now, even though China did hit a satellite, uh, and here you link to some other blog with a with a with a, uh, that, that focuses on, I guess, Asia and arms control, um, that that this test was really highly rigged. This was nothing like actual kind of kind of conditions that you would face, right? I mean, this was an unusually compliant satellite for someone who wants to shoot it down. Well, right. I mean, it, it broadcasts uh, a signal, um, and they were able to sort of bring it right over the test site, uh, and they didn't have to. I mean, one of the one of the things about this anti-satellite weapon that's somewhat distressing is, if it's the missile that we think it is, it can be basically driven around on a truck and set up sort of anywhere in China. But having said that, they seem to have done the test from a fixed position. So, you know, they, they basically removed any of the uncertainties. Uh, you know, in a war, actual mileage may vary. Right. And it seems to me that's, the, that, that's something to emphasize. What you said is that the deployment, these weapons are kind of, well, it's ironic to say they're not rocket science because actually what they use is rockets. But the point is you shouldn't imagine, as you might, based on, you know, kind of the, the American Star Wars initiative, that you need some kind of ground-based laser that vaporizes satellites. You can, yeah, oh no. you can take a ballistic missile and, and, with enough testing, turn it into a reliable satellite killer, right? That's, that's yeah, kind of the bad so. news. Yeah, I mean, the way to say it is that this isn't easy and that the Chinese aren't there yet, but that there aren't, in this case, I think, any fundamental technological challenges. It's, a, it's an engineering issue. But the good news is that... Tests are discernible. They are detectable, right? You can tell because we, right. we knew this long before the Chinese were admitting it, A. Uh, and B, there's well, some testing Well, if you look at the NORAD done. catalog, we knew it before they even fired it. Oh, really? How do we yeah. know that? Uh, I suspect they use signals, intercepts, and overhead imagery. Okay. Um, that's impressive. Well, and, you know, this is one of the things that annoys me is... Uh, Bob Joseph, who's the Undersecretary of State for Arms Control in the Bush administration, that very day was giving a talk about how an, an ASAT ban would not be verifiable, knowing full <laughs> well that the U.S. intelligence community was monitoring an impending Chinese ASAT test. Well, what was going through his head? I mean, what, yeah, does I'm, he, did I'm he sure know he, he was, was lying, or did, does he really think... I mean, not that you know, but I mean, what could have been going through his head? I, you know... 
I think if you say something over and over and over again, and he's been saying an ASAT treaty is not verifiable since the 1970s, I don't think anything's going through your head. I think at that point it's become such a rote statement that, you know, his brain shuts off, his eyes roll up in the back of his head, and he's basically speaking in tongues at that point. So is there no, I mean, is that an argument that had more validity before our take, detection capabilities were what they are today? No, I mean, I, I don't think so. I mean, essentially, that is always the argument about any arms control treaty, is that the other side could cheat. And at some level, this is true, because this is kind of one of the great sophistries in the debate. I mean, we're never going to spend an infinite amount of money to verify a treaty, right? We're always going to make choices. And we're going to make choices that say, okay, we want to be 80% sure, we want to be 85% sure. And, and that's just, I mean, that's just life, right? I mean... We don't, we don't expect weapons to work 100%. We don't similarly expect treaties to work 100%. So, right, you know, but if you have an 85% chance of detecting a... I mean, it sounds like we have a very good chance of detecting the testing of this system. That's right. Between, I mean, the, the, is, between the rocket launch and, right. the, and the debris that ensues, if they actually succeed, right? Right. I mean, the, the question is, is uh, it's usually phrased as, can you detect militarily significant cheating? And I would say that in terms of an ASAP ban, the answer to that is yes. But, I mean, all of this seems to me to converge on the conclusion. I mean, the, the two key things. A, once you've got, it's not all that hard to develop a reliable system. But B, you do need a series of tests yeah, which absolutely. are detectable to do it successfully. And China's not there yet to, do, to have a reliable system. And, and by the way, we are, right? We, we tested one long ago. Uh, yeah, we did. We're in 1985. The... the uh, so it seems to me the conclusion is inescapable that it's kind of really imperative that we, you know, that, that we negotiate a treaty. It would be verifiable. It would be in the interest of our national security, right? Right. That or get out of the space business. Those are, I think, our two choices. Wait, but get out of the space business in what sense? Well, I mean, stop relying on space assets because they're going to be vulnerable. Yeah, but I mean, we can't we do that. Treaty... I mean, that, is, that is a form of surrender in itself, to let, to let oh, other nations have a capability that we don't have. I mean, we're not, anyway, we're not going to do that. I'm, I'm not saying we ought to. I'm saying that those are our two choices. Right, that's and a how lot of ridiculous times, the alternative is. Right, and, you know, a lot of times you get people like, oh, well, a treaty would be difficult, it would be complicated. And it's important to keep in mind that, you know, a world with no treaty isn't the current world. Right. It's a world with a lot of ASATs. Right. And, and you know, that's it, it's well, really important to stress that the logic here is relatively straightforward, which it isn't always in arms control. For example, if you try <laughs> to imagine an enforceable biological weapons convention, you yeah, know, that's it's extremely complicated, and only a fool would say, oh, sure, we can do that. But this is, this is a much more straightforward case, and the logic behind doing it is about as compelling, right? Uh, you know, I've thought that for years now, but <laughs> I haven't been able to convince anyone in the Clinton or Bush administration. That's why we're waiting for the next uh, Democratic administration. Yeah, well, maybe infiltrate. they'll put me in charge of that. <laughs> to just have people call me if you need a reference. Yeah, That'll do it. it. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's almost time to talk a little about Iran. Is there anything else you want to say about uh, about how urgent it is that, that uh, the Bush administration heed your advice? I mean, I, I would just say this, which is if they see the Chinese preparing to do this test again, I wish they would say something. Yeah, because they knew in advance. Yeah, I mean, they did nothing. They're like, oh, look at that. That's A mortal strange. threat to our space assets. I wonder what we should do. That's kind of strange. And also, I mean, maybe it's related to the fact that the, the Bush administration floated this line after this test that, well, maybe the Chinese government <laughs> didn't know that this test was going on. Now, now I think certain kinds of freelancing do go, in, do go on within the Chinese power structure. I wasn't aware that this was the kind that would go on, right? I, I, I would be surprised. I mean, I'm willing to believe that the senior Chinese leadership didn't get a, shall we say, you know, fair and balanced presentation of the debris risks. <laughs> so they might have been a little surprised at how messy it was. Ah, uh, yes. But I would be surprised if they were totally totally in the dark. And I, the thing I would say is it wasn't just anyone in the Bush administration who floated that. It was Steve Hadley, the national security advisor, yeah. right, saying, well, I don't know. I mean, this is his job to know the answer to that question. Yeah. I mean, to be sort of like just musing to the New York Times about how little we know, I just, I, <laughs> that, that's professional misconduct.
Yeah, that, I thought that was odd. Well, okay, well, quickly on Iran. Now, Iran right. has... I guess there's good news and the bad news. Uh, some apparently bad news is they blocked some nuclear inspectors, right? Right. And these are are these are these are these inspections are they routine part of the NP the nonproliferation treaty or what? Um, well, I would have to double check exactly what those guys were going to do. Um, but generally speaking, Iran had in the sort of lead up to. Uh, the last couple of months, uh, maybe the last year, had been uh, accepting more intrusive inspections than they were obligated, and, and more or less they've been scaling back their their cooperation. Yeah, in fact, uh, I think they said this doesn't right. doesn't uh, relate to their compliance with the NPT. So maybe this was some of the more liberal inspections they had been tolerating that are now. Yeah, and I, I, I admit I, I honestly haven't mm. had the precise opportunity to check. I suspect what's going to happen is, you know, the Iranians are going to have some pretext or some excuse, uh, and so they're going to argue it wasn't part of their obligations. I mean, I'm someone who thinks that, you know, at this point, the letter of Iran's obligations is not quite enough, given that, you know, they violated the letter quite a bit. Uh, and so, you know, I, for me, the legality of blocking the inspectors is not so important as the sort of what that says about how that regime feels about cooperating right now and, and the level of our awareness of their program. Well, the, the nonproliferation treaty in general is not as tight as it needs to be, right? Yeah, I would, I would say so. I mean, one of the, that actually a nice way to say it is not as tight. I mean, I hear a lot about loopholes and things, and that's, I think sometimes that's a little bit casual. But at least in the case of the NPT, uh, there, there is sort of a, a great silence on the issue of the nuclear fuel cycle, right, which are not just reactors that make power, but, you know, the ability to enrich uranium and, and reprocess plutonium, all the stuff that you would also want to do to build a bomb. And I, just there has, there's been a lot of good thinking about that, but not like a lot of political will to do anything about it. Okay. Um, now, and, and Iran does, is doing this, by the way, in response to the UN, uh, the UN sanctions uh, that we sponsored. Right. Now, on the positive side, Ahmadinejad has kind of gotten his knuckles wrapped a little, I guess. <laughs> As I understand this, first of all, uh, a newspaper kind of owned by the, the cleric uh, who, who Khamenei, who actually has more power than Ahmadinejad, kind of said that Ahmadinejad had, should be distanced from the nuclear power operation or something? What's, is, is that something like the truth? Uh, I actually hadn't seen the newspaper report. I had seen another report that suggested a similar knuckle wrapping, which was that uh, Khamenei, the supreme leader, uh, which, you know, is a pretty awesome title, uh, has more or less been sort of shunning Ahmadinejad and making it difficult for him to see him and not really consulting uh, with him and more or less has been marginalizing him from nuclear policy. Now, the fact that that, you know, ends up in a newspaper, right, directly criticizing him, that kind of thing, if it were true, would be uh, absolutely a, a great, you know, indication that maybe there was a little bit more sense of compromise. Uh, Seems to be the case. He also came under criticism from this dissident cleric who is not part of the government structure, but, but mm. uh, you know, he ran into that. And... Uh, and then also in these local elections, I don't know, a week or two or three ago, uh, yeah. that, that that reflected on his standing, although he wasn't in them, uh, his right, side right, right. did did pretty badly, I guess, and it was taken as a little bit of a re popular rebuke of him. Yeah, we were actually surprised by that here. I mean, we we thought that the same dynamics that pushed him into office were going to, uh, you know, help candidates like him. I guess is the way to phrase that in in that election. Uh, and we actually were talking about scheduling a conference here, and we deliberately <laughs> avoided that election um, and this kind of current time period because we figured that, you know, it would be kind of a glum period. And we wanted to at least let the election go by. But yeah, you know, it shows, you know, just because we're Harvard. <laughs> and I guess the, the question we can't know the answer to is, now that, that he seems to be drawing criticism uh, from within the power structure in particular, uh, and also from without, uh, Ahmadinejad, that is, is it, 
is it there are several possible explanations one is that they sense because of these local elections that he's weakening and they've been waiting for their moment right another is that uh they they really don't like these u.n sanctions uh not to mention the prospect of more although i uh i don't know how really potent the current sanctions are the third one that the bush administration might stress is that, that you know we do seem to be uh, amassing, you know, uh, a, a little bit of an attack capability in their vicinity with, you know, aircraft carriers and stuff. Um, and, and maybe to some extent that's what's uh, leading people to finally try to, to stifle Ahmadinejad. I, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I, I don't know that we have any way of choosing among those theories, right? No, yeah, I, I, in fact, I think we don't. I mean, one of the things that drives me nuts about the way that people talk about these debates is there's almost this assumption that, a country like Iran is going to respond mechanistically to whatever we do. You know, if we put twice as much pressure, they'll be twice as compliant. But, you know, in reality, the oh, it, it's the classic Tip O'Neill formulation. All politics are local. And the reason that the Iranians make decisions uh, and the reasons that the Chinese make decisions have a lot to do with their own internal domestic arguments. And so it seems to me that, you know, Ahmadinejad, just simply by virtue of rising to uh, a position of influence and power, made a lot of enemies because there are people who covet that position themselves. And, you know, it seems that we've got to, on the one hand, be willing to be strong and show that we are serious about, uh, you know, punishing them if they go down the nuclear weapons route. But on the other hand, you know, if we, we have to give them sort of the same amount of carrots, right, to go with the sticks, all of the benefits that would come with cooperation, and then hope that in their own internal debates, right, that people use that to undermine somebody like Ahmadinejad. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's, you know, this is an art, not a science. Okay, so I guess the good news, bad news there is, I mean, the, the bad news is that the, the, the Iranian government shows no uh, diminished determination to acquire nuclear weapons. I mean, they're blocking the inspectors and, and so on, I guess. And the good news is that the guy in the government who seems to be the one guy you might worry would actually do something crazy with the nuclear weapons uh, seems to be losing power. Well, you know, the way I would say this is if you imagine a meeting between Ahmadinejad and, you know, somebody who's sort of moderate, you know, they're probably going to have a series of arguments, right? And it may be that the moderate side is going to decide that, it's stupid to fight over blocking inspectors because if you support blocking inspectors, then you'll look tough with your, you know, with the people in Iran, uh, and so you know you focus your battle on something else. So, I mean, to me, that's the important part about being involved in negotiations. I mean, a lot of times, I hear this this conservative critique that you know we shouldn't be involved in negotiations for negotiations' sake, and that that to me is frankly stupid. I mean. We, we use negotiations to get intelligence, to learn how other governments make decisions, you know, and frankly, in international politics, 90% of, of the time, you're just playing for time. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know you've got to, uh, you've got oh, to yeah. head down to Washington or something, right? And, and yeah, I do. And then India. And go infiltrate the power structure? Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I've got to look for an apartment. Well, good. Well, you know, you should keep quiet about that. Uh, on, on infiltrating the power structure, you know? Oh, Keep right, otherwise profile. I'll end up getting waterboarded at Gitmo. Yeah, yeah. Well, also, you just want to sneak up on them. <laughs> um, okay, well, thanks. I think we've clarified everything, and if the world takes our advice, uh, we'll live to see another day. Yeah, but then I'll be out of business. Oh, well, then let's, well, then let's don't run this. Okay. How about 50% of our advice and just avoid a nuclear war? Okay. Well, I don't think you actually have to worry about running out of uh, a, a demand for your services anytime soon, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Well, it was good talking to you. Same here. See you around. Okay.